All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Until then, adios. Conversations from the Dark Side. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of the 2024 season of Conversations from the Dark Side. I'm your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo Aaron, joined tonight by everyone's favorite night crawler, a man who literally dwells in dark places that no man in their right mind would tread. Give it up for Jack Flack. What can you say? With an intro like that, like I feel like I should be on tonight's list of nefarious individuals. You almost were, from what I heard. <laughs> so that's for a story for another time. You know, uh, often, as many of you know, we will come up with these topics literally years in advance of a show. They'll be well prepared. And then we will present you with... Uh, unmitigated super genius information to enlighten and, and entertain and tonight is no exception except we came up with it last week but it's still going to be great in fact i'm going to give flack 100 credit for this one because this week's topic the dark side of crime now you know i know here recently uh true crime and stuff it's all the rage uh flack i see all the you know the documentaries and whatnot going on about it Everyone's into it, uh, but what separates your average uh, uh, murder or run over a guy with a steam shovel to what we're going to be talking about this evening? Um, you know, there are certain crimes uh, that are have just been cemented in history. I think probably sometimes it's uh, a lot of times it's due to either the horrific uh, style of the murders you know if they are uh, particularly grisly or gruesome uh, just your above and beyond type crimes and a lot of times it has to do with the number of victims as well so i think those are both of those things we'll see in in a lot of the people that we talk about uh, this evening yes i think that sums it up nicely so we're going to uh, sort of split up our, our our conversation points into two distinct categories tonight we're going to call one Victorian and one uh, more modern and we're going to kick off as you should in a uh, numerical order of year which is uh, talking about vic some Victorian crime now uh, there was plenty of room for crime in Victorian age uh, the 1800s were wrought with issues and problems and I think when and we I talked to Flack about this before the show we kind of wanted to go over just some of the things that were being dealt with in, say, London in the Victorian era, you know, the 1800s, uh, that would that would sometimes drive people to do things that were unbelievably horrible, uh, you know, if uh, sometimes uh, just for self-preservation. Uh, so, <clears throat> just right out of the gate, what really affected this era more than most, in a weird way, was the class system. Uh, the class system in uh, the UK, uh, in Britain, in London at the time, was basically uh, uh, very tight. I mean, you people would ignore you. You could be on fire, and if you weren't of the of the right class, they would not. Uh, they wouldn't pee on you to put it out. I mean, and that's a some that's of a our shoot. victims may be actually. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, the, so people uh, did. I mean, whatever they could to survive. Now, what made this much worse? is that there was also a major population increase in Great, Great Britain. I should mention that the Victorian crimes we're going to talk about are all, all take place in Great Britain. Uh, so, what, and part of this was the industrialization uh, that came swooping in. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, life didn't change much for hundreds and hundreds of years before the 1800s, and it had changed more in a few years than it had in... You know, in 500 years, just due to the mm -hmm. industrialization, uh, due to, you know, scientific 
uh, uh, endeavors, and and they they made that they made changes that sort of brought people closer together into the cities. And so, what does what does this mean when a city like London, for example, it's where it's where its uh, population increases like sixfold, and that's a shoot, that's a sixfold. You know, six million people romping around the city, not meant for that many. Well, what you get there is you get hunger, poverty, rampant crime. You get uh, mud. There's animal droppings everywhere. So you get rodents. You get uh, people that live on the streets. There's not enough housing for people. There's not enough money to go around. Something else you get is tons and tons of, uh, like, disenfranchised and unhomed children. There were a lot of street urchins uh, running around uh, back in the day. So you saw that everywhere. You, you see rampant overcrowding. If you see uh, pictures of the era, I mean, the city streets are packed with suckers. I mean, packed. It's, it's like a Japanese train, except it's out in the open. Uh, so what does that mean? Of course, you, you know, you've got horrible streets. You've got horrible everything. And when society's uh, class system pretty much makes it so no one cares about the classes under them it's a recipe for crime and dismay isn't it flack you know i just read a news article this week about a celebrity uh who was uh someone was trying to blackmail them and uh, the part of the the document said that they were being blackmailed for millions and millions of dollars but you know back in the victorian era someone might kill you for three shillings yeah you know, I mean, like it would literally be, um, uh, you know, people would be so desperate for uh, money, for resources, for for things like that, that, um, you know, that was a big thing. And then also, like, there was something that didn't really exist back then that today we call uh, forensic science. So uh, when someone would get murdered or killed and the police would show up, you know, and then they would go. Yeah, it's a dead guy. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. You know, like, like the the best bet is that you would just be mortally wounded, and you could tell someone who had stabbed you and took your your money. You know, so yeah, it's just um, uh, especially for the lower classes. You know, just a, a terrible, awful time, and not enough to go around. Whether that is money, whether that is food, whether that is housing. You know, all those things. You know, I mean. Uh, um, you know, today we, we see things, uh, you know, we see commercials making fun of it. You know, the old, the commercial where the kid has the bowl, may I please have some more, you know, that that sort of thing. But, but yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, it was a time where when you had too many kids, uh, you know, you just eh, just give some away. Absolutely. (laughs) Take them to the orphanage. Leave them with a family member. Say you'll be right back and then don't come right back. Put them on a train. Buy a one-way ticket. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, people out there left to fend for themselves, which unfortunately also meant that there were a lot of people without those social connections, uh, which means if somebody disappeared, it wasn't always easy to uh, figure out who that person was or whether they had disappeared at all. Uh, Yeah, exactly. It's a... This was not the time that you wanted to grow up in, not the place, that's for no. sure. Especially when a lot of no. the uh, families had came to town from uh, from the outskirts, you know, trying to get some action, get some money. So, uh, with the with that backdrop in mind, uh, we picked out a couple interesting uh, events, I guess you would say, that took that uh, took place at various points. And we're going to start off with I, this right here. I have to say is one of the nuttier stories you're, you're ever going to hear. Uh, and it is the story of spring Heeled Jack. spring Heeled Jack. Now, uh, in some circles, this is, a, this is a pretty well-trodden tale, but I think we got some fresh looks on this one. So, uh, the, you're probably thinking to yourself, what is Sp- spring Heeled Jack? Well, uh, to, to explain what he is, it's better just to get into what he did. So, uh... Early in, or somewhere in the ballpark of the 1830, late 1830s, or, or mid-1830s, is when Spring Hill appeared. Uh, so, the first recorded... Now, there were people that have went back and said, oh, they saw him before here, or whatever. But the first very popular account 
Uh, it happened in October of 1837, just in time for Halloween. Heck, if you think about it, uh, you know, the anniversary will be coming up on this. 1837, a girl named Mary Stevens was walking uh, to a place where she worked as a servant and had just visited her parents. And as she walked along, and this is right in London, a, a, a strange figure jumped in front of her in a dark alley. Now, of course, you got to think, there were a lot of dark alleys. Uh, so that <laughs> probably happened a lot. So, But not like this. So the figure r- jumped up on her, grabbed her with his arms, grabbed her with a tight grip. Then he started kissing her face. Now, it, it, that's not the best. But while he was kissing her face, he was ripping her clothes off with his claws. His metallic claws, as they were reported. Uh, in fact, Mary herself said they were cold and clammy as those of a corpse. Uh, she screamed, and the uh, and the uh, figure uh, fled the scene. Okay, so that's the first thing you're going to see with it when it comes to Jack. Now, that's, that's a pretty pedestrian story, except for the clawing and ripping of the clothes, <laughs> Flack. Uh, but, I mean, mm-hmm. and, you know, it could happen. Uh so, tune in the next day. This, uh, so here we go. It's a different victim this time around that uh, fl- that this fellow took off after, and as he ran past this victim, this unnamed victim, he went past the carriage and caused the coachman to lose control of the carriage and crash the carriage, and then, and this is the crux of the name. Spring Hill Jack was seen by several witnesses after he had wrecked the carriage that as he jam- jumped over a, a nine-foot wall. And as he ran away, he cackled with the... <laughs> he cackled with glee, <laughs> Flack. What do you make of that? Yeah. You know, um, in, in, in those, those times, you, you had kind of two eras of, of something like a... Um, uh, copycat crimes, right? Yeah. Uh, like you might have something like this, and then uh, you know it would get into the newspapers. But you got to think how news traveled back then, right? Like it would get in the newspapers, and then maybe you didn't, you know, if you live far away, maybe you didn't get the news for a week. Maybe you didn't, you know. So for it to happen so close together, like one day, the next day, like it seems to me, whoever this person was, it's this is the same person. This is the same guy, right? Like, there's not enough time. It's not like today where it happened and then all of a sudden it was on the internet and everybody knew about it, right? Yeah. So, so for it to happen that fast, you know, it has to be that. Now, um, you know, it, you always get, uh, uh, there, there's a, in fact, if you look on, um, when, we, when I knew we were going to talk about this, of course, I looked on Wikipedia and there's a this, this drawing of him and it's a very, very famous drawing of him leaping over the wall. When I was a kid, you know, we've always talked about those time life books, and I had the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, tales of the unexplained book, and it had this picture. And I remember looking at it, and the thing is, I think what's creepy about this uh, is not that he's just leaping over a nine foot wall. Like that's creepy enough. And and again, uh, all you had to go by is is witnesses, right? You got if so so. If you got one guy, well, he could be a loony. But then when you get a lot of people that all say, hey, this happened, you know, that that's all you have to go on, right? But the fact that he is, uh, in the picture, he's just grinning. He's just like, hee hee, <laughs> I'm spring Jack, leaping over that wall, you know? Um, again, there, there's, there's parts of it that, of the story of the legend, where, like you say, okay, his metal claws, well, maybe... Maybe he just had sharp fingernails. We don't know. Or maybe, you know, these things. But if all these people say that they saw him jump over that wall, that's the part that, um, uh, you know, also back then, that's going to prevent people from from chasing you, right? Like, you're not, you know, not everybody could do that, I suppose. You know, what What really took this... So, at this point, and we're going to get back to the class system. I hate to beat a dead horse, but it's true. And all the people that had reported seeing this guy were servants, uh, were mm. carriage drivers, were people that were walking around in the middle of the night in dark alleys, right? So, <clears throat> after a few sightings of this fellow, this is when Spring Hill Jack really was born. Uh, on mm-hmm. January 9th of 1838, the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Cowan, 
uh, talked about Spring Hill Jack uh, because he had he had received a ton of of complaints, and so he was like uh, he mentioned it. Now he didn't say like uh, you know this is real, he's out there, you know. He almost was just saying that this is some stupid stuff, and all these people right, keep writing right. me these letters about this. And it's it's silliness, but what that meant was, and, a, and as strange as this sounds, this is the way it was interpreted. A higher class person, one of the highest class person, had acknowledged this guy, and set the wheels in motion for this this legend to uh, to spread, uh, and spread it did. Now, the best, the probably the most interesting thing that Jack did uh, was uh, coming up. After this happened, because he had a couple incidents that sort of sealed his uh, name and his sort of uh, his sort of gimmick uh, for posterity. Uh, so, on February nineteenth, eighteen thirty nine, a lady named Jane Alsop answered her door uh, at the father's house, and there was a guy that claimed to be a police officer. And I've seen two different versions of the story: one where he was at the door. And one where he was standing at the wall, like in front of the walk that would lead to the door. And he said, ma'am, ma'am. He's like, I'm a police officer. We have captured Spring Hill Jack here in the lane. I need a candle. Bring me a light. And so she went and got got him a light. And then when she took the uh, light out to him, this uh, cop suddenly threw off his cloak. And was suddenly, <laughs> she was face to face. With Spring Hill Jack. Now, we should talk about what, what does Spring Hill Jack look like? Well, he's supposed to be hideous. And he's got glowing red eyes like Mothman. And mm. he some accounts say that he's got like a devilish appearance. Uh, at least from what I've heard. Is that about what matches with what you've got, Flack? Yeah, you know, I think the thing is that there were a lot of different accounts from the people, but that drawing uh, became so well known that a lot yeah. of people just associate that picture with with what. Which I mean, he basically looks like a traditional, you know, devil, like a caricature of a devil with the pointy little beard and the and the you know kind of horns and the, and uh, high heel like like um, shoes that Prince would wear. Yeah, which is uh, pretty amazing that he would jump. Not only could he leap. Nine feet, but he does it in heels, which is impressive. I'm pretty sure that Prince could actually do that. I, I think I saw him in Chappelle <laughs> pull that off. But here's the, you know, here's something. Every creature, you know, you've got the generics. I've always got it, devil horns or rats. But this one, this one's got something I don't think I've ever heard. Most of the victims claimed that Spring Hill Jack was wearing some sort of helmet, <laughs> which struck me as odd. So I don't know if yeah. the helmet had little pointy things on it. Anyhow, <laughs> this was she was face to face with this character. Without yeah. saying a word, he grabbed her and began doing what Spring Hill Jack does. He takes his claws out, and she Spring she healing. said they were some kind of metallic substance that stick. And then he starts clawing at her clothes. Now he was particularly nasty with her. He was he cut her. He actually got down to where he was cutting her skin, and he actually pulled some of her hair out. Uh, and uh, luckily for her. Uh, someone ran out of the house, and it was her sister, to, to uh, I guess, to scare him away. One would wonder why he would, that would scare him, uh, but it did. Uh, and that, of course, that was major news at the time, this attack. What do you make? I mean, so far, these attacks, I mean, studies have shown that people that are being, uh, are, are in the middle of a traumatic experience, they have really bad memories I mean, do you think mm -hmm. this is one of those cases, or does someone, I mean, or is this something artificial, you think? Is there a guy who rigged up some metal claws in, his, in a back shop and uh, got on a, wa a wacky hat and decided to go cut up girls' clothes? What do you think? <laughs> you know, the thing that seals it for me is the helmet. Like, I, like everything else kind of makes sense, you know? Yeah. But that's kind of, uh, th that part, and and you can, like you said, you can imagine these these women would have obviously been been traumatized, you know, especially if, um, I mean, if a if a guy comes to your door and he he's all disfigured and he's wearing a, a metal helmet and he's but he's like, hey, I'm a police officer, and you go, okay, and then he throws off and he goes, ha, ha I'm really spring heel Jack. Like, did he put the helmet on then at that point? Did he put on the things, or he was just already had all that stuff on and he was just wearing an overcoat? 
and she didn't see it. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> you know, again, like some of the stuff is uh, a functional, you know, like the claws are functional. He uses these in his attacks, but we don't hear about anything about this helmet being functional unless maybe he was afraid that, um, you know, uh, uh, a Bobby would, would knock him in the head with a baton or something. You know, maybe I don't it's really a, know. Maybe it's a Bobby's helmet one side and then you kind of like give it one of these to turn it and then that's where the yeah. little you know it could be one of those special hey if the guy can make his own claws he can make a special hat i think that's well within his wheelhouse uh so as if that wasn't bad enough there's one more a attack that he's well known for and this one we're gonna get into the end of this because this one gets real strange so uh a few days after that last attack this would have been february 28th uh, 18-year-old Lucy Scales and her sister were coming home after uh, visiting a family member. Uh, so they were passing along Green Dragon Alley. Right there's your first mistake. You know, that's a, <laughs> that doesn't sound too good. And they saw a person standing, uh, it says here, at an angle in the passage. So I guess they were leaning up against the wall. Uh, she walked in front of her sister. The person came up. It was wearing a large quote, a cloak. And then get this. Uh, in true, like, sinister freak fashion, he spit a quantity of blue flame in her face. A quantity of blue flame. That's exactly from the, from the lady herself, uh, which, after this, she couldn't see. So she sort of pulled, like, a great Muda or a Kabuki on her. And then, uh, once that happened, she freaked out, and, uh, he was, and he took off. So, but, uh, so this started the, uh, this started the the tradition or the or the uh, rumor that Jack not only did he have red eyes, not only did he wear a helmet, but he also could shoot blue flame from his mouth. Um, what do you think of this one, Flack? It's like the 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 myth keeps growing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like at first it's the metal claws, then it's the metal claws, and he can leap. And now it's he's got the claws and he can leap. And he's got the uh, uh, the other thing, you know, or now he's got the blue flame. So it's like it just keeps growing and growing. You know what I mean? So I um, uh, it, it is uh, is he retooling his attacks? Like when he goes home each night, he's like, oh, I got to come up with something better for, for tomorrow. Um, or or uh, or is he just waiting to unveil each of these things? Well, you know, so there was often a rumor or the the. Uh... I don't know if any of the... I, I never read that any of the actual victims said this. They could have. That he that he had a, a, an aroma around him, you know. And that mm. it's possible that that aroma was uh, some sort of uh, combustible material that he was... I don't know. I mean, we're, we're going Contained down a road here. You know, and that where, he sh where he was shooting out of his mouth, you know, or whatever. Yeah. I, I, uh, but uh, uh, that's it's. You think mm -hmm. if you got shot in the eyes with blue flame, you'd be blind. So I'm assuming what yeah. whatever he hit her with, you know. But I mean, this is something that comes up again and again. And the funny thing about Jack is, so keep in mind the instance we've talked about, which are the famous ones. You're talking about things that happened in the 1830s, right? In the late 1830s, the mm -hmm. last like credible report uh, that people, and I say credible was in 1877. So someone <laughs> someone pretending to be uh, uh, Spring Hill Jack, a copycat or whatever, were, were keeping the ball rolling for, you know, and several more decades. Uh, and so what's, what makes us all sort of amusing is uh, Spring Hill Jack became very popular in, in these Penny Dreadfuls, which... Do uh, you want to explain Penny Dreadfuls to, to the people? Flag? No, no, go ahead. Penny Dreadfuls were like basically just exactly what they, they're like a little, I don't know, like little well-distributed pamphlets that had stories yeah. in them. And and they were very popular because they, it was like, uh, it was like uh, cartoons for the masses, basically. They were animated, or they were illustrated and kept simple. And so, yeah. Spring Hill Jack. Not quite a comic book, right? But well, I mean, there, it, in, I mean, it was an illustrated pamphlet. They had there were written words in it, but I think they yeah. were illustrated in a certain way to make uh, the illustrations gave someone 
Uh, most of the people who could read something, they could at least have someone read to them, or at least they could look at a picture and try to get a general idea of what was happening. That's the way it was I described see, to me, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was, and this happens often in, I mean, gosh, it's probably happened in a million different characters. Somewhere along the way, Springfield Jack became a guy who hosed the rich uh, and the, and bad guys. So he was more like a combination of Robin Hood and, and Batman, I guess, ironically, because there is wide speculation that uh, Bob Kane must have taken some of the lore of Springfield Jack and used in uh, as as uh, brain candy to make Batman. Now, the Spring Hill Jack we're talking about didn't do any. They had did not have this reputation. He was a mm -hmm. creepy, semi rapist nut job. But like I said, <laughs> they, the the pity dreadfuls and his appearances in serials. He appeared in tons of serials. They became popular as this mythical good guy. That, that helped yeah. out people and, and punished criminals. And uh, even in some if, some of the more famous pictures and illustrations of him, he does take on a very Batman-like stance with a cape that looks like bat wings, and he's on top of a building. He's, you know, it looks pretty heroic. So one would wonder if Bob Kane had, had seen any of this stuff back when he uh, created Batman. It's, I, I think it's unlikely. It's not like he could hop on the Internet and go dig it up. So he would have to have been exposed to it, you know, in America some at some point, which is unlikely. But it can, you know, it could be possible. Um, do you think what? So what do you think about this with the with the fact that these attacks went on for like you know thirty plus years? What are we looking at here, Flack? You know, I think the early stuff was probably all one guy. Um, I think that there was probably, um, you know, some sort of embellishment that went on from these uh, eyewitness people because, you know, you're talking about these uh, people that would be, uh, you know, like low, the low income, low class people. And so, you know, to get... You know, even someone to know their name or to be in a police report or something would have been something. So if they were, you know, to add something to the story, to add something, you know, that and, and then they are become a part of history. So I could see that. Um, I mean, I think the span we're looking at is almost 50 years for some of those later accounts. So I'm trying to imagine now whatever age. Spring Hill Jack. And, and by the way, we're I, I'm operating on the. Uh, on the uh, assumption that nothing here is supernatural, right? Like, right. like, you know, like this is all on the level. So no matter what age Spring Hill Jack was, if you add 50 years, can you imagine jumping, like jumping off something that's nine foot tall? Yeah, I'd be Spring Wheelchair <laughs> Jack you. at that point. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So I don't you know, either that was something that, uh, you know, something that became a, a myth kind of thing you know or people you know picked up the torch and kind of you know just just kept it going on i can't imagine that would have been the same guy but uh the thing that that i never really understood about spring heel jack is that almost all of the people that we'll be talking about tonight had uh and even if their their um motivation is just a murder that's a motivation right just yeah. to do something but what is what is this guy's like what keeps him going like every day he's like he's risking his life if people caught him back then he would not they would not be a spring heel jack trial yeah they would just beat him into you know yeah. and then there would be and then there would be spring heel body you know laying there right so um i mean he's risking his life to just show up and women's doors with his metal closet and be like hubba 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 you know and then run away like i i don't i don't like what's the what's the long game for spring hill jack that's the part it, i'm not sure that's a valid question and, and a few things you know looking over this material and, and absorbing some stuff before the show and i thought i was watching number one his antics of being spring hill really never i heard him only maybe once or twice mention any of the credible stories so it's not like this guy was mm -hmm. bouncing around like, you know, <laughs> you know, he, he he maybe someone just was nuts. Maybe he just got a really good jump at it. Maybe he knows parkour. But you're right, the right. Motiv the motivation to run up I mean, 
if you think about it, now it works better if he's like uh, a paranormal type character. Okay, he's a weird sure. demon, sure. But let's pretend he's a real guy, just for just for a minute. Here's a guy that manufactured some gloves or had claws that uh, is mm-hmm. a hideous and has somehow rigged up a thing to give himself red eyes and can shoot fire from his face. Like this guy, this guy's a G. He's like the he's like the Stark. Of Victorian time, you know, <laughs> right. and and all after all the work and all the experimentation to get this outfit cooking, he goes up and hugs and kisses a girl and rips at their clothes. I mean, <laughs> right. Well, and this is again, you know, like like um, we've already mentioned, but like there is no internet back then. There's, I mean, I guess there's like medical research, but I mean, let's just say you're a lunatic and you're like, I want to become Spring Hill Jack. Like you could probably come up with the helmet. Like I can imagine. If you walk around on, you know, Portobello Road, you're going to find a helmet for sale, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, you got to be able, like, you got access to a machine shop. Do you know how to make blue flames shoot it? Like, this is not stuff that the average person knows. You yeah. Know? So, um, and even, like I said, the ability to, did he have something mechanical in his shoes or his legs that allowed him to leap like that? Or, you know, was it like, um, you know, the first recorded history of uh, scary parkour? Like, we don't really know, you know, but uh, yeah, it's just like, like you'd have to be able to, to create all these things too. So you would think someone in this area would be like, you know, there is that kid Billy that's always down there at the machine shop making gloves with knives on them. <laughs> like, like they would be able to to figure out who this person is. It's funny you should mention that because before we close the book on Jack, there's one. So people have asked, who is this guy? And there was one name that keeps popping in mind, and I can't for the life of me understand how this guy. I mean, so there was a fellow named uh, he was an Irish nobleman named the Marquis of Waterford. Okay, mm-hmm. Henry. They always blame it on the Irish. Irish. Here we go. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. sorry, Flack. Another one. Guess what this guy was known for? Drunken brawling. So, hey, all right. All right. So he's that living. It down. He's, he's living up to it. So you know, we call that a family reunion. There you go. Right? So <laughs> in the '40s, there was a rumor that started to circulate that this guy was Spring Hill Jack. Okay. Now, trust me, this guy was way worse than Spring Hill Jack. He was a, a debaucherous scumbag. He would he would welch out in his debts. He would do all kinds of crime. There's a report that he did a crime with his buddies. He had a bunch of drunk, rich, noble, jerk buddies. They would do a bunch of crime. When they reported to the uh, judge to be charged, they wore bear and wolf skins into the courtroom. The ju- this is in the newspaper. The judge is like, what the hell? And, of course, he couldn't do anything to them. They were nobles. There's another report right. where these guys went around and stole. They went around a wrecked part of the town. Then they stole a bunch of paint, and then they literally painted part of the town red. <laughs> it was red paint. But here's the so you're thinking yourself, okay, maybe this guy's nuts. Here's the kicker. Um, during a so the marquee had a boat built, right? And the boat, of course, you got to put a bunch of cannons on there. So why him and his drunk buddies were out <laughs> screwing around with cannons? This is why I don't think this guy was Spring Hill Jack, because he blew his leg off with a cannon. <laughs> he was a one-legged man. So no, that doesn't that doesn't match uh, Spring Hill. <laughs> like if he if none of these women <laughs> mentioned that the guy running away also had a peg leg. Yeah, no kidding. But I mean, I I guess if you could, I look at it this way, Flack. If you could build red eyes, if you could build uh, spring heels, if you can build metal claws. You could certainly build a robotic fake leg to go along with your blue flame breath. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> it's, you know, now that you mentioned all this, I feel like what we're describing is uh, the uh, uh, the evil version of Inspector Gadget. <laughs> it's like an Inspector Gadget gone wrong. That's great. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> so that's a quick discussion on Spring Hill Jack. We're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to touch on probably the most notorious villain of the Victorian age, Jack the Ripper. We will be back in two shakes. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. Just a gravel star on a mountain road from all the tales. 
I've been told there's a monster sea soaked in sand. Top a genuine fifties tourist trail. Step right up, that'll be six bucks. And when the tour bell rings, you gotta trust your luck. No hypertension or vertigo. If you wanna dive in, then mystery hole. That's right, Jim. We're here on the grounds where the most recent Mothman sighting has occurred, and I gotta say, it's pretty creepy out here. It was last seen around Point Pleasant, West Virginia, terrorizing two elderly ladies. The poor old ladies were just trying to enjoy their bingo night when Mothman appeared out of nowhere. Oh, shit. Do not fear the Mothman. Please leave our windows and doors unlocked when you come to visit Point Pleasant, West Virginia. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. And we're back uh, with more Conversations from the Dark Side. Myself, Amigo Aaron, our good buddy Rob O'Hara, a.k.a. Jack Black. Tonight's topic, the dark side of crime. And we are continuing our discussion of crime on the dark side of the Victorian age. And I think, Flack, you've got uh, probably the king the King Dong of all criminals of that era. Yeah, you know, I wanted to throw in a little bit about Jack the Ripper. I don't, I don't want to get too much into him just because we've got some more interesting people further on down the list. And Jack the Ripper is probably the most well-known of, uh, you know, the most infamous, even though... I mean, I don't want to say that his, I mean, his murders were, were terribly, terribly gruesome. You know, he, he, um, uh, literally, uh, you know, there was a reason why a lot of, uh, uh, police and a lot of experts thought that Jack the Ripper probably had some sort of medical knowledge because, uh, he, he, he didn't, you know, it wasn't like he butchered, uh, his victims. He sliced them like a surgeon might have done. He removed body parts. He removed organs. Uh, he did some really, really uh, terrible things, you know. Uh, but one of the reasons why I just wanted to throw him into the conversation tonight is to piggyback on something that you said about um, the class system, you know, of this Victorian time. So one of the things, and, and it's hard to know if, um, I mean, it probably he knew this but he may not have known how well this was going to work out in his favor was that jack the ripper um murdered five prostitutes and uh, this was over a period of i think about 12 weeks was the total span so it wasn't like it was uh you know this long like years long run or, or decades long like sometimes we have with uh um, some of the other people we'll be talking about. It's not really a, uh, a terribly long span, you know. This was um, in the late 1800s, 1888, you know. But um, uh, each of these these victims were um, prostitutes. So not only would they have been, you know, they're, they're kind of like outside of that... Uh, of society, you know what I mean? So they're outside of this group of people that would, uh, first of all, I mean, they're, it, it's, you wouldn't say that they wouldn't be missed because people knew them, right? They had coworkers, they had friends, they had whoever, um, but they wouldn't be missed in the same way that other people might be missed. Like if you're Bob and you go to work every day and all of a sudden you don't come home from work and your family goes, Hey, where's Bob? Like you're going to know immediately. You got like, ripped. Where, where these... <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, there's, there's several Bob's here, some of Bob's over there. Um, <laughs> but you know, so this would have been a little bit different situation, you know, with, um, uh, the types of, uh, victims that he chose. Um, the thing that's always fascinated me, and this goes into again, kind of what we were talking about before is that, they didn't have the type of forensics that we have today. You know, if there was a modern day Jack the Ripper uh, today, if someone were to murder five people, that would be uh, like 
you know, I mean, we've we've all watched, um, you know, the forensic files. We've all watched these specials. Like one person can get killed, and they can find out so much about the body. You know, we know now based on um, the state of decomposition, right? Like we know how long someone has been dead. We know, um, you know, what type of weapon what was used, what size, what, you know, any, we know we can tell all sorts of things today. Um, the stuff that they do with bullet trajectories and all, all that kind of stuff, you know, so it's, it's really, I mean, it is a science. It's literally a science. So, um, you know, back then, uh, they would they would find these women sometimes they found some of them they found relatively quickly some of them they didn't find you know until hours later or, or the next day or whatever so uh they, it was just kind of all over the place with <laughs> literally and figuratively with um yeah. with jack the ripper you know um now uh there are a lot of different uh, theories about who jack the ripper was and it seems like every 10 years or you know over the years like i remember watching um i think there was a in search of episode yes. about jack the ripper and they talked about you know there was always like there was a um uh, the surgeon that was a big theory the one guy who was a surgeon there was a theory about the one guy that was uh, royalty and that was a big theory that it was uh, a member of the royal family and that they basically it was it was uh, uh it wouldn't uh, I forgot who was it, that guy, but whenever he was basically, they put him in a mental institution and then the killing stopped. So they go, well, maybe that was it, you know, but there was this, this one guy, this Aaron, his name is Aaron, also Aaron uh, Kaminsky. And so that there was a, this documentary that was on, I think it was on Netflix uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but there was this this big revelation that uh, of all the, the victims, one of the victims was found with a scarf and the scarf has blood stains on it and the blood stains do not belong to the victim and so a few years ago they did uh, dna testing on the scarf and then they did testing on uh, you know some of the uh, descendants of these people that were suspects and the one family that was a match was this aaron kaminsky so a lot of people thought, hey, uh, this this has been solved. But there's a problem. There was multiple problems. First of all, this scarf apparently got handled by a bunch of different people, including members of these families. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's super contaminated evidence. So a lot of people write off that DNA evidence. The other problem is that uh, he was, this guy, this Kaminsky guy, was accused because he may have known the victims well if he knew the victims and he had met this woman before and she was wearing that scarf then there's a possibility that his dna would have already been on that scarf anyway so he might have already had contact with this person so it's not you know an open and cut uh kind of kind of case you know what i mean it's um uh, and that's the frustrating thing about a lot of these. Uh, again, today, the first thing, if we found a, a, if we had a murder scene, the first thing we would do is uh, protect the crime scene so that it doesn't get contaminated. But back then, you know, everybody was like, hey, let me see that scarf. <laughs> hey, let me put that on. You know, woo, woo. Like everybody's touching everything. <laughs> that's the what crime they scene. did back a, then? My God. They How did, did they catch they anyone? Was, <laughs> they would pose with selfies with the scarf. You know, it was terrible stuff. So, um, yeah, so, so, you know, I, I think there's lots and lots of cases. I know, I think last year, I know we talked about DB Cooper and, and some things, but it's like this, you know, the, the, the ways that we have to get DNA and test DNA evidence today is so good, but it depends on having, uh, you know, a crime scene that has, hasn't been contaminated. And so this stuff just wasn't preserved the way that we we needed it done um I, i'm gonna get your your take on jack the ripper and then i want to talk about one other possible subject or uh, suspect that has been brought up and then i want to mention briefly the movie time after time so uh, but i you know what's your history with jack the ripper like where did you hear about this you know the crimes and stuff and, and did you have any attachment to this as a kid or anything well absolutely I, you know much like a lot of the things i found out i'm sure 
that the first time I ever heard about this was probably in search of with my dad. Every Monday night, uh, we'd watch in search in search of. And uh, with Leonard Nimoy, and they covered everything. Mm-hmm. And this was just another thing that they covered. And there were a lot of once once that show took off, a lot of shows copied the format, so you'd see the same basic information. It's a lot like YouTube, kind of think of it. Uh, but the the one thing about this, if you look into the various murders, and like you said, it being class based, uh, most people, you're right. These are people that the cops they got killed all the time. Prostitutes right. got killed, man. Kids get killed right over with a carriage. Eh. But the difference was the way they were killed. That's what made it important. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, of course, once people demand uh, an answer, well, then suddenly the pressure is on the police uh, to give the upper crust what they want. They want a guy. They want a, mm-hmm. someone arrested. And, of course... You know, if you are uh, of that era, who are you going to cast your eye toward? You're going to cast your eye to foreigners. You're going to cast your eye to the poor. You're going to cast your eye to the insane. You're going to pa- cast your eye to people like that. And so when you hear about these theories, uh, the doctor theory, this other theory, at the end of the day, I don't think we're ever going to have enough information. I mean, books and books, reams of books have been written about this case. But when mm-hmm. you boil it down, we they're all working from the same limited information that was given based on the case files. Like you said, it's not like uh, these guys were using uh, plastic baggies and Ziplocs and, and, and gloves. They were just out there grabbing stuff. And so I don't think we're ever going to find who truly uh, committed the crime. When you hear that it was done in a doctorly way, I'm, also, I'm even suspicious about that if I'm honest. I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. Uh, um, I'm not saying that someone with medical prowess didn't commit the murders, but what I am saying is I've looked at enough Victorian cases to realize that the, the people that appraise these cases are often idiots. Like, they make mistakes. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. They leap to conclusions. They'll be more than happy to convict a sucker who wasn't in town. Like, I mean, I've seen it happen over and over with these. Yeah. And yeah. so I wouldn't be terribly surprised if someone was like, oh, man, this guy must have been a real stud surgeon. Was he really? Maybe. Maybe he was just a guy with a Victorian exacto knife and, and some time to kill. You know, we don't know. I mean, could I, could, could I dig into somebody and pull out their liver? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, these are people that worked with livestock. They, they gutted, uh, you know, they gutted all kinds of stuff to eat. I got, could I do it? No, but someone that knows something about anatomy could probably do it halfway decent. So even that part of the case, I find it uh, dubious, to be honest with right. you. Right. Well, well, what always struck me is that you're operating from the, the crime and then going facts forward instead of going backwards. In other words, uh, could I cut open, a, let, let, I'm just going to say a cow, because I don't want to say a person, but <laughs> let's say, could I cut open a cow and remove their liver? No. But I could cut open a cow and remove something, Yeah. and then tomorrow they would go, hey, the seventh chamber of his stomach was missing. That meant something. Well, maybe I didn't know what I was doing. Maybe I was just, you know, wanted a souvenir or something, and exactly. I grabbed something. Like, like, maybe he wasn't going for a liver. Maybe he was just like, what? Hey, that's yellow. And he just took it, you know. So, yeah, that's a good um, point. Yeah, yeah. So, so it may not have been. And also, you know, again, um, uh, not because of the the class thing necessarily, but we we've heard even in modern times where it is uh, police are being pressured to solve a crime, right? And so. They'll find somebody and then, you know, we have people today that are on death row and then all of a sudden you find out, well, they didn't do it. And then they go, well, we, you know, we had to, we had to get somebody, sorry. <laughs> you know, we had to, they, they had to do that to, to, uh, I don't really want to say it this way, but for the better good of society, you know what I mean? Because if you've got the whole town worried about Spring Hill Jack or Jack the Ripper running around, like now the police got a problem with everybody, you know? And so if you go, eh, you know, it kind of quit happening. And if we think it was probably this guy and then let's, let's move on and let's get society back rolling again, rather than everybody, every business shutting their shutters at five o'clock. And you know what I mean? Like sometimes 
I mean, I don't want to say that throwing somebody under the bus is for the better good of society. It's definitely not for the better good of that person. Right. But I think they were definitely pressured to say certain things, you know. So if they were to say, oh, well, it was a, uh, a surgeon and this guy kind of disappeared. And then so there's nothing to worry about. Let's all get back to business and making meat or whatever people are doing. You know what I mean? Wow. Of all the things to be making after that conversation. So, yeah, it's. <laughs> Jack the Ripper, I mean, I mean, now granted, aside from carving him up and taking up, they also did horrible things to their private parts, which that is probably the work of someone who, we can't agree that this is a sick puppy. Uh, sure. There's no doubt about that. But was he a skilled surgeon? Unknown. But he was definitely yeah. a, 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 a sick person. Now, I will say, if anything good came out of Jack the Ripper, it's his various movies and TV appearances over the years, <laughs> uh, including that time travel gimmick I watched one time where they had to go back in time to uh, stop him or go forward in time, I believe. But he's been yeah. everywhere. He's been on the Enterprise. He's been all over the place. Uh, do you have any... Uh, are, is there any uh, media connected to uh, Jack the Ripper that, uh, you, that you find interesting? Time after time. I love that movie. Oh, yeah. That was one of the... the uh, um, that's the one Early, I was talking you know, about, right? The time yeah, travel. It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was one name. of those HBO, yeah, HBO specials. You know, I mean, it wasn't an HBO special, but it was one of the early ones that HBO got a hold of. So it was on like three times a day for about three years. Yeah. So I saw it a bunch of like, what better viewing for an eight-year-old, you know, than this? Uh, but but the story, if you, if uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's that H.G. Wells really had a time machine. Yeah. Like he had really built a time machine. And uh, the and the time machine has a key that only he knew about, and so he would have this meeting of people, and uh, um, uh, they would play chess or whatever. And there was a guy that always beats him, and uh, that guy he comes running in off the street and all this. And what's happened is, uh, at the beginning of the movie, he is Jack the Ripper. And by the way, Jack the Ripper is played by David Warner, who's one of the. I mean, David Warner I think just died this year. I think earlier, I think 2024, David he was in Warner everything. Died. For, I mean, he good, bad, everything. and everything in between. He was in. I mean, he's he was in Tron. He was in uh, The Omen. He was, I mean, just so many great yeah, films. He was great. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's Jack the Ripper. So to get away from the police, he gets in the time machine and goes to the future. But the thing is, he doesn't know about the key. So the time machine returns back, and H.G. Wells uh, gets in the time machine. By the way, H.G. Wells is. Um, uh, Malcolm McDowell, and he then he goes after him, and then uh, of course he get they get to modern times, and there's this big twist kind of towards the end, where H. G. Wells confronts Jack the Ripper. I mean, it's like 1980 or whatever, you know, and he's like, "You're a man out of time. You got to come back and face your crimes." And Jack the Ripper turns on the TV, and it's just he's flipping channels, and it's all the nightly news and it's murder and murder and war. And he's like, buddy, I'm not out of time. You're the one <laughs> that's out of time. He's like, I found my time, you know? And so, yeah, I, I always love that. Uh, I do want to talk about one possible suspect. And this is something that I, I doesn't get mentioned as I don't think it's as popular of a theory, but uh, there was the uh, very prolific serial killer, H.H. Uh, Holmes. I think he's known as um, America's, uh, first serial killer and it is documented that he went overseas and was in london during that time yeah uh and um h.h H. wells uh he i uh, wrote it down here uh, he had um uh somewhere he, he was um they know for a fact that he killed 27 people but it's suspected that he may have killed up to 200 people like he was uh real good with the blade as we like to say so the fact that he was in london at that time and the type i mean the way the crimes were committed is the same as what he did i don't i don't think that that uh theory is is too far out there what do you think well <laughs> i have i have heard that one and mm -hmm. I, it's i mean it's listen compared to everything else you hear it's not bad you know mm -hmm. i mean this guy we obviously he's got the track record uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it could happen. Uh, it's funny to me. It's funny. We're just talking about H.G. Wells. Uh, I have to wonder if it's, it's funny how it's one letter off, effectively, for, if you think about it. It's kind of wacky to think about. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's – I mean, that's, as, that's 
of all the theories I've heard over the years, that is one of the more ones that seem feasible to me. You know, given uh, you know, mm-hmm. given the situation. But again, you'll never know. We do know what H. H. Wells did. I mean, he he, uh, uh, like you said, a flirt. I don't, how many did you recall his victim list? Holmes, H. H. Holmes. H. H. Holmes. Excuse me. I was completely oh, yeah, yeah. out the door there. <laughs> what was it? I was I, I got my brain went nuts. I just said H. H. Wells. How many people did he end up knocking off over the years? Well, like I said, they 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 know for a fact that he did twenty seven, but. Because of, because of the way he did it and where they found bodies and stuff, they suspect that it could be up to 200. That's crazy. That's totally That's a lot crazy. Of people. Yeah, yeah, it is. I will, just to close the thought, I don't have anything that uh, riveting, but I will say in terms of, I, I did love that movie. I, I remember watching it after I had sunburn at the beach one time with Wes. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to watch because I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> but there's another bit uh, media bit with Jack the Ripper that I always found amusing you ever watched Amazon Went on the Moon, which is a, it's sort of like Kentucky Fried Movie, but not quite oh, as good. Yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a there's a segment in it where they sort of uh, make fun of uh, shows like In Search of. It's called BS or Not, and their theory, and I think this stands up, uh, Flack. If you really look into it, is that Jack the Ripper was in fact the Loch Ness monster, and there's a whole, there's <laughs> a, an entire segment where the Loch Ness monster goes down to White Chapel. And hunts down and kills these these prostitutes. It's actually quite amusing. If you ever get a chance to happen. watch it. Uh, but uh, that's about the only thing funny about the uh, Jack the Ripper uh, saga. That's for darn sure. So we're going to step away for a minute. And when we come back, we're going to change the pace a little bit. Because a murder is fun when you're one. But it's always more fun when you got to pal along. We'll be back in a few minutes. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. experiencing conversations from the dark side and we're back as we finish up uh, our, the first section of our show talking about uh, the dark side of crime in Victorian times uh, which I really uh, have enjoyed learning about uh, Jack the Ripper there there was you mentioned some stuff there I had the long forgotten if I'm honest it's funny how much you were, you learn just from uh, good old Leonard Nimoy and just whatever whatever you can. Uh, it, that's a well trodden tale, but I always hear stuff I didn't know before when it comes around. <laughs> now, uh, so here I want to get into something a little less uh, well trodden, but it, I mean I always was very fascinated by this, and this is the account of the Burke and Hare murders. Again, we're back to London. It's 1828, uh, and so. Just a rundown of what would have you? Did, were you familiar with this uh, topic, Flack? No, I thought it was a brand of purses. Uh, allow, allow me to uh, uh, try to uh, give you the scoop here. So, um, picture yourself. This actually is it's more Scottish than London. So, picture yourself uh, in Edinburgh uh, in the 1800s. So, what was going on? Uh, as we mentioned, this was the age of enlightenment in a lot of ways. 
And so one of the things that was happening was medical research and things that have been taboo for, I mean, hundreds of thousands of years were now becoming in demand. And one of those things was uh, learning about the human body. And how did you do that in the 1800s? Well, what you did was you cut a sucker open and you looked at what made them work effectively. Uh, and the demand uh, to be taught at the uh, prestigious schools around the country was high. This is one of the top places in the world for this sort of uh, knowledge. And, of course, uh, Scotland had laws that required you to... Uh, only certain corpses could be used for medical research. And, they, and of course, who got to get used? Low-end schlubs, of course, because... Right, because this right. Scottish was just much like everywhere else. And so who would they let you cut open? People that died in prison, suicide victims, uh, like orphans, uh, bums, you know, people died in the street, stuff like that. And so there were so few available corpses that what there was a new a job that opened up. And these people that performed this job of body snatching were called resurrection men, or the term I always like to use, they're resurrectionists. Resurrectionists would dig up graves and steal the bodies. And then they would sell them to a college or, or a speaker and, and, take the, and pocket the cash. Now, this became such a, a common occurrence in this area at this time that people started protecting people, their family members' graves, including putting little cages <laughs> over the graves and even putting large stones over the graves. You know, and oh. so and it's funny, even uh, in America, you occasionally come across a grave that's like this with a with a with like a metal cage stuck over it to keep people from fooling around with it. But this was becoming uh, quite a problem. And so with that backdrop in mind, um, again, it's 1828, and there's a fellow named uh, William Hare who has a home that he, ha he accepts boarders in. Uh, and so someone has died in his house. He consults a friend of his uh, that he met named William Burke. What should I do with this body? This really makes me mad because not only is this sucker dead in my house, he owed me four pound back rent, <laughs> which that's a lot of money, by the way, back in mm -hmm. those days. I'm sorry, seven pound back rent. Oh. And so... So Burke's like, here's what we do. We're going to sell this guy to the college. So they go and find a fellow uh, named Dr. Knox. And Dr. Knox gleefully accepts the corpse and uh, pays them the kingly sum of seven pound, ten P for the body. They split the, they split the cash four uh, pound for, uh, four pound for the boarding house owner, Hare, and three pound, ten for his buddy. So a close split. So... All is well. They move along with their lives. Two months later, Hare comes back to Burke. He's like, "Listen, I got another problem. I got a chicken, or I got a person in my house that's sick, and they're, I think they're catching, and I think they're gonna get other people sick, and people are afraid <laughs> to rent the room. So guess what? Uh, Burke had an idea, a cutting plan, if you will. Let's kill this sucker too." So they gave this. Now they're they're free resurrectionists. That's right. They've changed their <laughs> they've changed their tune. So here's the cunning plan. It's the old get them liquored up with whiskey, then put a pillow over their head trick, which is what they do. And right. they uh, take this fellow to Knox. Knox don't ask no questions, by the way. Uh, and they he pays them ten pounds for this guy. All right. So bam. All oh. of a sudden. This is a, suddenly this is a great way to make money, okay? And so they start right. offing people left and right. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, uh, both these guys are now they're not those stable guys, and so throughout the killings, they'll occasionally break up, fight. Sometimes they'll actually fist fight with each other, but they usually come <laughs> back together in their need for cash to kill another of the people that right. come to stay at the house. And, of course, their wives are also involved. So you've got both oh. their wives and both the guys that are killing these people. So finally, <laughs> they, they've they killed two people. Then they kill another, oh, let's say 13 or so uh, this, in this way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is all This is all in... Uh, in 1928, or eight, uh, 1928, it's all, it's uh, it's in that era there. 
And so it's 1828, by the way. That's a typo on my part. So what happens? Well, what happens is uh, finally they screw up. They have this cunning plan to bring forth uh, this guy over and kill him, or this chick, I should say, and they 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 get him liquored up and uh, with a group, okay? And then they kill the person, and but some of the people that were staying at the boarding house that went out for the night, and they came back. And so what did these guys, idiots do? Because they're drunk. They're stupid. The people that did the killing, they're like, we got to hide this body. Well, here's a pile of straw at the end of the bed. We'll stick the corpse in there. <laughs> So the people came home, and all of a sudden, they're like, wait a minute, is this a body? I'm going to go tell the cops, you know? And so, this bed sure is lumpy. And so uh, as they're walking to the cops, one of the guy's wives find out about it. They try to bribe the chick. Listen, here's a tenner, you know? You didn't see nothing. They're like, are you kidding? It's like, take a hike. <laughs> and they'd also made the mistake of killing off a, I guess, a, I don't know if he's popular, but a well-thought-of or well-seen beggar that was around town. So, that, this guy was already missing, and when the cops heard about this, they're like, okay, we're taking this seriously. For once, they took someone seriously. And they uh, went to the house and checked out the scene. By the time, so get this, though. So, while they were going to get the cops, Burke and Hare went in the room. They're like, oh, crap, the jig's up. They got the body out, and they drove it to Dr. Knox. All right, so keep in mind, they're, they know their, gig, their jig is up. Dr. Knox accepts the body, just like he accepted all the other bodies. And when he thinks that when he thinks that the uh, the fuzz are onto him, the first thing he'll do is take a corpse and chop the head off. That way they don't know, you know. Okay. So when they get okay. there, they of course the cops go to his office. They go to his uh, body room, and of course there's the body, including the body of the guy that everyone knew that was a bum was also there, and they knew him because his feet were all jacked up. And so the head was gone, but the feet were still intact. They're like, oh, that's the guy. Mm-hmm. And so they were all immediately arrested, And uh, as you can imagine. And so get this. This is, this is typical of the way police operate. Uh, so Burke, first of all, Knox wasn't charged at all. Dr. Knox was completely out of, of trouble in this because he didn't do anything wrong technically. Right, so you he can, just was like, "Hey, I don't know where they keep finding dead bodies." <laughs> yeah, the police were still sort of worried that they, because they didn't have a lot of evidence to work on, because a lot of bodies were gone. So they offered Hare immunity for prosecution, and uh, if he would turn King's evidence, and since he can't testify against his wife, it would also save her. So basically, if, effectively, he, he gave them uh, immunity, and of course, with him on their side, they instantly. Uh, they instantly took care of Burke, although Burke's wife did get off the hook. But at, so on Christmas Day, the judge returned a verdict of not of guilty, and and just like it was like sixty minutes. And then get this: this is the best part. Uh, the judge told him, and this quote uh, from the judge: "Your body should be publicly dissected and and atomized, and I trust." that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. And sure enough, Burke was hanged uh, on the morning of January 28, 1829, in front of a crowd of 25,000. And his skeleton wow. his skeleton was given to the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh, and it's still there to this day. Really? <laughs> you go. So... I was... I thought Knox was going to buy it. No, no. And I will say, just as, <laughs> as, a, as some closing, uh, while Knox was not popular, he kept, he kept on trucking for a good while. And then as, yeah. for, uh, uh, as for Hare, so the cops held on to him for a while because he was not, as you can imagine, he was not popular, even though he was sure. given immunity. And they snuck him out of town in a carriage. But people in the carriage with him recognized him and when they got to where they were going, they were like, hey, everybody, this is that vicious killer. And so a mob <laughs> formed to smash this guy. Well, the cops were like, ah, oh, crap. So they pulled up a dummy carriage, and they snuck this guy into a building and out the back door to another carriage and got this guy to basically the border. And that's the last uh, anyone knows as to what happened to him. 
So yeah, yeah and, and into town ride. Hit him in some hay. They should have yeah. hit him in hay at the end of a bed. <laughs> well, what an angle. <laughs> now listen, th- this is this is why you have me on this show, okay? Yeah. While you're talking, I am on the uh, British version of the uh, inflation calculator. <laughs> okay. So ten pounds in 1830 is basically roughly 1500 pounds today that's a a hefty sum yeah so um because i you know i was thinking like well if it's you know if it's 10 bucks like that's like uh you know i was like 10 bucks but that's 1500 dollars. not that i'm more tempted to do it (laughs) i'm just saying it it does sound like a lot more money um, I do feel bad for the guy in this store story who is positively identified by his weird feet. Yeah. I don't feel like that's what, what I want to go down in history. You know, the, um, the ironic thing about that guy is they tried to pull the old get liquored up and then uh, smother trick. The guy wasn't a drinker. <laughs> so he's the only bum uh, on earth that wasn't in the booze. So finally, they just and this guy was the hardest guy they killed. They finally had to overpower him and, and like just take him out the hard way, basically. Right, and then Knox is like, I don't know where they find these bodies that have cracked skulls. <laughs> if you think about it, though, uh, this guy, I was reading how many bodies that that guy went through in, a, in like a week. I mean, mm-hmm. he it was um, it's ludicrous. He did two dissections a day, uh, every day, for 400 students a class. And now, if this makes you feel any better about Dr. Knox, just a little side note. Uh, he was disfigured after having smallpox and was horrible looking and was blind in one eye. So he was, he was here. If you're going to sell a body to a guy, this is the guy. Was his other eye glowing red? I think I know this disfigured man. (laughs) Was was this free? We've just cracked the case. Dr. (laughs) Knox was spring heel Jack. Got it. You know, um, (laughs) the Victoria, I mean, we could do 10 shows, 100 shows on various crazy, oh. creepy things that happened in the Victoria area. And then another 1,000 shows on the bizarre creatures that were roaming around the woods and haunting the back alleys of the area. It's a lot of fun. But up next, after the break, we're going to get in. We're going to bring it forward, just like time after time. We're getting in the time machine with Jack the Ripper. And we're coming forward because uh, there's no more creepy crime the crime that happened a couple days ago in your backyard. We'll be right back in two minutes. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. The world's largest teapot was dedicated across the border in West Virginia today, but before that could happen, a lot of other things had to occur, including a little help from our Wayne Van Dyne. And this is the world's largest teapot, a town landmark that almost wasn't. Local citizens wanted to restore it, but it was nearly falling apart from age. Well, I went and took a look at it. And with the rotted floor, the rotted walls, the windows out, the door off, I told them to burn it. I didn't think anybody could fix it. Someone did. It was restored by volunteers with money donated locally. But then a dispute with state highway officials over its location almost left them with no place to put it. (laughs) Governor Caperton's office finally cut the red tape, setting the stage for today's celebration, which even rain failed to stop. So it's official now. The world's largest teapot has been dedicated in Chester, West Virginia. Police Chief Terry Potts, Mayor Sally Riley, I dare you. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my hand. Wayne Van Dyne, KDKA Eyewitness News, Chester. are experiencing conversations from the dark side and we 
are back, ladies and gentlemen. Again, this is your good pal, Amigo Aaron, joined, as always, by the legendary Rob Flack O'Hara, talking about the dark side of crime. We've had a interesting jaunt down the road of Victorian uh, horrors, but now we're going to bring it up to date a little bit. And Flack has picked out some real interesting uh, cases to talk about. What do you got there, Flacker? So uh, for this segment, I've got two different cases. One is one that I'm sure you've heard of, and one is one that I'm almost positive you haven't heard of. So we're going to start off with one that I'm pretty sure you have heard about. And this is uh, the infamous Son of Sam killings. Now, uh, the Son of Sam killings took place in New York City in uh, 1976, 1977. So it's the late 70s. Uh, I went to New York City uh, several years ago, and my dad uh, gave me these warnings. He was like, uh, I'm, my, literally my dad said, don't go to Central Park unless you want to get killed. I mean, and I, and his experience of going to New York was uh, in the in the you know early to mid seventies, and when I went to Central Park, uh, which was about ten years ago, I did almost get killed. I almost got ran over by a buggy, like a carriage with a horse with a, a married couple who was taking pictures, and uh, there was a guy that was painting their pictures on an easel. Uh, New York City, for people our age, is way way different than what new york city was in the 1970s i mean it was uh, a really i don't want to say terrible but it was a really violent kind of dirty grimy place you know new york you know times square had not been cleaned up you know my dad told me the same thing he said go to times square if you want to see prostitutes and drug users and i was like when i went to times square i went to the world's largest toys r us <laughs> it was right there in the middle of toys r us so new york city it's hard to imagine what it was like at that time you know um so it was already kind of a scary place there was that the new york blackout the new york city blackout you remember that where um you know just all the power went out to new york city and people like the whole city uh i don't know how many people live there i know that when i went there i think the population uh, actually i i was told at that time that the population uh at night was seven million in new york city and during the day was 12 million because so many people come in from the boroughs in New Jersey to work in New York City. So, I mean, that's a lot of people to have in, what, 25 square miles, whatever it is. So, um, you know, it, when the, when the, the they had the blackout and all these people were just like, hey, like 10 million people decided to go loot. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's kind of a scary place to be, you know. And so uh, things got worse when uh, someone uh, these these people i think the one of the first crimes was uh these people that were in their car they were just minding their own business they were parked by the side of the road and a guy walked up and shot them i mean they were just sitting in their car and a guy just walked up to the side of the car and shot them uh and he had a uh, a 44 caliber that was what they was recovered was a 44 caliber bullet and so he was originally known as the 44 caliber killer but fortunately for police uh they didn't have to make up names for him because he told them his name uh this guy was kind of a lunatic he would leave long strange notes written uh either in blood or or written on walls like he would leave these big notes and then he started writing notes and mailing them to all the newspapers and he would mail them to the police so the uh um the killer was definitely someone who liked attention and this is something that we see today uh because the son of sam is, is still alive he's he's serving i believe six i think uh consecutive life sentences but uh, he told them his name. He said his name was uh, uh, the son of Sam. You know, he was, like I said, he was writing all these these letters and stuff like that. And um, uh, the, the time, if you, if you ever read about these crimes or um, 
uh, watch you know uh, any of these uh, like the docu series about this. Uh, it was so terrifying because these murders were random. That was the thing. You know, if you were in New York City and, and you got mugged, you were like, oh, I got mugged, you know. But this was just a guy that for no reason would walk up to you and shoot you. And, and it was like all, a very anonymous type of crime where he would just walk up and just shoot people. Most of, most of the people that he killed were sitting in their car, you know, just either uh, like sometimes it was couples, boyfriend, girlfriend, or sometimes it was women and he would just walk up and shoot them. Uh, and it was, and people were so afraid at that time that most of the women uh, that were shot, shot or, or that had been shot, shot had uh, long black hair. And so women, this is how afraid people were. Women started changing their hairstyle. Women were cutting their hair or dyeing their hair. And there was actually a wig shortage in New York City during that time because uh, so many women were buying wigs to try to hide their hair. So, I mean, this is a, a really uh, a crazy uh, type of thing. And, and for one person to inflict this kind of chaos on an entire city was really kind of unprecedented and so um basically what ended up happening was uh, uh there were a lot of reasons why that the son of sam murder was a was able to operate for so long and one of them was because at this time all the boroughs in New York City did not share information. There was no national database for things like this. So everybody was uh, holding their cards close to their chest. So one borough might have information, but they weren't sharing it with another borough and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, you know, it doesn't take very far in New York City to get into a different jurisdiction. So that was part of the problem. Uh, and but the police were were desperate for information. You know, they were just saying like, uh, if if you if you see anything, you know, if you see a car, let us know. If you see, um, you know, somebody, uh, let us know. And there and some not all the people that were shot uh, died. Uh, the, you know, it's just mass chaos in New York City, right? And and um, the police department was so desperate. It was a if you see something, say something type of situation. But they were getting inundated with false information because people would say, hey, I saw a guy. I saw somebody on roller skates. I saw a dude on a scooter. I saw, I mean, they're getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of tips and it's not helping. But there was a tip that came in that uh, said that they had written, they saw police and they had written a parking ticket on a car and the car belonged to a guy in Yonkers but uh, it was like 30 miles away from where it was supposed to be. And so they thought, well, this guy doesn't really have a reason to be here. I mean, they were following every lead they could possibly follow, right? So uh, the police go to visit this guy in Yonkers. So it was another, another um, area of New York City. And when they go talk to the police there, they're like, yeah, we kind of suspect that guy's the son of Sam. <laughs> Oh, geez. Like, literally, they said that. They said people have turned him in and said, we think this guy might be the son of Sam. He's kind of weird. Um, and also, uh, there is this a dog that's related, and he had shot the neighbor's dog because the dog had been talking to him. And they were like, yeah, this maybe this guy, we should go, we should go investigate him, right? And so it's almost too easy. They go up, and, and uh, this guy... Uh, David Berkowitz is walking out of his apartment. He goes and gets into the car. Then the police surround the car and, uh, and they go, you know, they ask him who he is. And, uh, uh, he says, he just smiles at him and he goes, I'm Sam. So he knew he was caught and in the car is a paper bag. And when they look at the paper bag, there's the murder weapon and bullets and casings. It's like the whole L. We're going to get into conspiracy theories. It's almost too easy, right? Like, like how could you be getting away with all these murders and everything, but also be so dumb, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that that's what people, to me. right. That's what people think is like, <laughs> wow, what a strange open and shut case, right? And David Berkowitz was like, David Berkowitz is such a uh, attention whore that he was like, yep, I'm the son of Sam. 
I did it. I'm the murderer. I shot them all and uh, and all this, right? And so uh, as they go into the court proceedings and stuff, he starts telling them what a lunatic he is. You know, he starts saying that um, uh, that his the neighbor's dog was possessed by a 6,000 year old demon and the dog had been telling him to commit the murders uh, and, and all these things like that. Um, also, David Berkowitz, I don't know if you could tell from that picture, David Berkowitz was 24 years old uh, and he was working for the post office uh, mm. and he had been in the military. He was actually had been a, he'd, he'd like a won medals for sharpshooting and stuff. So, um, but he was, he was a strange dude. And then, um, you know, Usually when they, they find people like this and they go talk to the neighbors and they go, yeah, we always thought that guy was strange. That's exactly what happened here. They were all like, yeah, that dude, like, they were like, yeah, we could see that. We could see him being, you know, the son of Sam, right? Uh, so this is one of the problems with serial killers. They are unreliable narr narrators. Narr yeah, narrators. So they, they tend to change their stories a lot. They tend to change the facts a lot. And uh, so one of the things that kind of came out is that David Berkowitz had been participating, that he had met with uh, members of a, uh, let's call it a cult. Um, and uh, uh, the cult was called, I have this written down here, the Sons, uh, the, so the Process Church of the First Judgment. Oh, okay. gosh. That's the complicated Right, which was part of the 22 Disciples of uh, Hail Satan, which is part of their name, okay? Uh, so this was an actual group of Satan worshipers that were uh, meeting in and around New York City, okay? So apparently he had met with these people before. Like, this is kind of documented, okay? Uh, but here's where stuff starts to get really weird. There were a couple of guys that were a member of this cult, and when they had gone back and looked at the uh, witness, uh, like the artist drawing of the who had, had done the shootings and stuff like that, some of them did not look like David Berkowitz, but some of them looked a lot like these other two guys that were in the cult. <laughs> and so this theory starts kind of coming around that maybe there was not one son of Sam. And in fact, David Berkowitz started using the term sons of Sam. Uh, and so there was a famous television interview with David Berkowitz where he went through and said, uh, they asked him if he had committed all the, all these murders. He said, well, I was at all the murders. And they were like, well, but did you do all the murders? And he goes, well, I didn't actually pull the trigger. And they go, wait, what? Like, you're not the son of Sam? And he's like, well, you know, we're kind of we're kind of all the sons of Sam. So that's a, a pretty um, big conspiracy theory. Now, here's the problem with that conspiracy theory. Is that David Berkowitz has since recanted a lot of that stuff. And he says, you know what? I wasn't getting. I wasn't talking to a dog after all. He said, I. They had offered me this book deal, and I was trying to get an insanity plea. So that's why I had come up with that. So maybe it wasn't about a dog and a six thousand year old demon. Uh, you know, maybe it was just he was involved with these other people. So I. It's hard. It's hard to really know. Now, there have been some investigative reports done that have said they have linked other people to these crimes, but nobody wants to talk about it uh, because, uh, um, you know, they're they're still like these people would still be age wise. They would all they're all still alive. Anybody that would have been involved in that would would still be around. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you that. Um, uh, David Berkowitz no longer wishes to be referred to. As the son of Sam, uh, now he goes by, um, I forget what, he, what it is now, but uh, uh, but he's, he's changed his name and uh, because he can't, it's now the son of hope. And now he is a born again uh, preacher. So he preaches uh, in, in the prison system 
and he has said that he believes that there is an actual war between uh, good and evil that took place inside him. So he thinks that, or he says that, uh, you know, that, that the devil was operating through him and now he has been uh, uh, born again. Uh, but the thing is, David Berkowitz says a lot of stuff and he keeps saying stuff to remain in the news uh, and, and things like that. Now, uh, one thing you know, we were talking about earlier when you were talking about something good that came out of these types of crimes, uh, one thing that came out of this was uh, his his ploy to uh, act crazy and get an insanity deal and get this book deal and stuff almost came through until uh, the state of New York passed a law which is now referred to as the Son of Sam law that prevents uh, convicted uh, criminals from profiting from their crimes. So they pushed this law through that basically prevented him from being able to write a book about how he was a crazy Satan guy. And the minute that they passed that law, he goes, all right, maybe I wasn't crazy. <laughs> maybe I was just uh, a, a weird um, murderer. This guy's so, a worker, big time worker. He's worked everybody. Big, time so i mean depending on you know either he was a guy operating by himself to get attention or he was a guy that was uh i mean he's definitely has been diagnosed uh early on with schizophrenia and, and some other so maybe he was a guy that had mental issues maybe he was being put up you know uh like people up for this cult were putting him up to it it's kind of it's kind of uh unresolved as to what the motive is uh, or whether or not he committed all of the actual murders that he is uh, doing time for. I will tell you one trivia fact that I always enjoyed is that there is a spinoff of that satanic cult, which is like a secret super cult underneath that cult, right? Like this is the super duper cult, the inner part of the cult. Um, and they, uh, because it was the, uh, the process, whatever, they're known as the four P's. And so they had their own symbol, which kind of looks like a swastika made out of uh, the letter P. Um, and so when uh, Danzig, you know, the artist Danzig, oh, yes. Danzig, I know Danzig. When he was doing his albums uh, when he released his fourth album. Uh, he didn't want to have a title. He just wanted to have an artwork on the front. And the record label was like, no, you have to have a name. We can't sell an album if it doesn't have a name. Uh, and so it just kind of became known as Danzig four because it was the fourth album. But a lot of people, including Danzig refer to that album as four P. And if you look on the inside, it has that logo. It has the insignia of the four P. Um, now of course Danzig likes, you know, to grab spooky clip art. Yeah. I was going to say, if anyone <laughs> was going to do that, it'd be Glenn Danzig. It or, would be, or maybe him. King so there Diamond is that, might get in you know, some of that action. I could see that too. So yeah, there's kind of that that tie back. But um, you know, I, I know that we were were awful young when this was going on. But do you remember any of this stuff, or you know, have you heard about it since then? Well, I do. Obviously, uh, I do remember it from uh, you know from the news. Uh, it was pretty big news when I was a kid, uh, mm -hmm. and I have heard about the, the people changing their hair. Uh, that's crazy to think about how, you know, every once in a while a killer gets around and just, I mean, it happened in Atlanta. It, ha you know, it happened in New York a couple times uh, yeah, where a, yeah. someone freaks out everybody, uh, you know, with their mm -hmm. heinous crimes. You know, I, I learned a lot from what you said there I, that I've not heard before. Was there no way to forensically tie that firearm to those other murders? Well, I mean, they could only tell, like, who was the last person. Uh -huh. to fire the gun you know so it, definitely he had done some uh of the uh of the shootings you know but like i said he he was quick you know at the time he claimed all of them he said it was me but then he said well it's kind of more of us that that gun had been passed around so it, it's hard to say you know and again we kind of go back to what we talked about like the forensics of 1977 are not the forensics that we have today yeah right it, like if they thought those other guys they could have immediately went to those other guys and got you know the the uh res like that what are the, the gunpowder residue on their fingers and, and done <laughs> things like that you know but, uh, i'll you know, work you may not know this but i think you do i work at a crime lab 
And mm. I work with forensic gun scientists who, and I see them actually. We have a gun range across the hall from my lab. Um, and you're 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 right. What they can do now uh, is amazing. They can really uh, hone in on guns and and bullets and firearms and all this kind of stuff. You would uh, be, would blow your mind. And I would do wonder if uh, how much that evidence uh, they kept from back then, if any of it was useful. Hopefully they didn't. Hopefully the New York City police weren't like the London cops. And flying around <laughs> and posing with it like they did before. They've all got their, their <laughs> son of Sam scarf on. <laughs> but you know, it's a it was a horrible thing. I, I'm assuming Flack, and you could give me some closure here. Uh, did the murders stop once they got a Berkowitz? Immediately. So, yeah. you know, I mean, either he was doing. It's not, I, my guess. This is a layman's guess, of course. He did it. He's a, a crackpot attention whore, and he got nabbed, and now he's stuck in a joint for the rest of his life. Sounds good to me. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other the alternative is that, you know, a bunch of people were doing it, and when one guy got caught, they were all like, ooh, we better quit. <laughs> like, that guy's going to take the fall. We're all going to, you know, so it was- hard to say. Uh, I think the, uh, the moral of that story is uh, don't go to New York City. I think maybe I may I don't know that might not be the takeaway. I well, know, I mean but, uh, I'll tell you, as someone who was uh, born in New Jersey and has mm-hmm. been to New York City a few times uh, back in the day, and if you think about it, I was there during the parts of time where your dad said don't go there. A good mm-hmm. move. I know my mom didn't like going there. I was too young to remember a whole lot about it from when I was there, but I I haven't been back. So, <laughs> listen, I'm a country boy. I don't need that. Even the chance of getting Berkowitz, I'm not down. You know, if I, uh, that's the way I look at it. That's excellent stuff. I really uh, enjoyed that flag. So we're going to take our last break, everybody. When we come back, uh, uh, another chilling modern tale of dark crime. Stick with us because you know we save the best stuff for last. This is Conversations <laughs> for the Dark Side. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. West Virginia, we've tested all of our activities for maximum family fun. Everything has been tested and retested to make sure your West Virginia vacation will be the best your family has ever had. So call today for more information and test out West Virginia for yourself. You are experiencing Conversations from the Dark Side. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final segment for tonight's episode of Conversations with the Dark Side. Again, if you're strolling in late, I'm your good pal, Migo Aaron, joined by everyone's pal, Jack Flack, a.k.a. Rob O'Hara. Tonight's topic has been the dark side of crime. Uh, and we've went briskly through the Victorian age up into uh, 1970s and 80s New York. And Flack has another destination for us. Where are we going now, Flack? Well, this is um, essentially, let's say, modern times. I mean, this is 20th century. Uh, this is, you know, I wanted to uh, pluck a little bit, you know, I mean, we've got things like Son of Sam. We've got Jack the Ripper. These are things that everybody has heard of. Um 
but I wanted to grab one that uh, I think that maybe you haven't even heard of, but by the end of it, uh, you you will have heard of it. <laughs> That's a bad transition. Unless your mic goes out, we'll be. I guarantee you're right. Oh, and then you won't have heard it. Um, <laughs> this this is a. Um, uh, somebody who I, I don't I don't even remember how I heard about this guy, uh, but I think I heard about it because uh, there was some controversy because for a short period of time, he was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as being the world's most prolific serial killer. Uh, they removed this entry from the Guinness Book of World Records because people complained and said, it sounds like you're making it into a competition. <laughs> So um, they said, yeah, maybe, maybe we should take this out. Um, but uh, uh, this man's name was Pedro Lopez. Uh, he has a nickname. His nickname is Monster of the Andes. So um, this segment, I mean, I'm going to dance around some things, but there's some pretty not nice things that happen uh, to children in this story and so uh you know i we won't get too graphic but uh but this is a pretty rough story and it starts off with a pretty rough uh upbringing uh, of uh pedro lopez he was born in colombia uh some bad things happened to him as a child and then he tried to do these bad things to uh, his sister and so his mom, apparently he was one of like 15 kids or 17 kids or whatever. He was in the middle, but the mom says, you know what? You're on your own. So he was kicked out onto the streets at the age of eight. <laughs> so Jeez. that is how Pedro Lopez's life begins. Uh, he ends up joining up with a gang uh, who uh, abused him in uh, really bad ways. So his, he does not have a good childhood. He does not have a good upbringing. Uh, he actually got arrested for uh, car theft and uh, went to jail briefly. And uh, he was uh, sexually abused in prison by three adult men. And so... Uh, How what old he was he was in prison, Flack? I mean, he's still really, really young. Like early 20s, maybe. Okay. Um but he got to spend a little bit of time there because he systematically went back and murdered all three of those guys. Um, so Dang, revenge <laughs> Pedro, murder. Pedro Lopez is, is not a good guy. Okay. Uh, and so um, when he gets out of prison, he just starts kind of wandering uh, South America and he ends up in uh, Peru. Now, he has some run-ins with the law in Peru. At one point, he is visiting, like, these uh, indigenous tribes because he's kind of, like, trying to stay on the outskirts of society, you know? Uh, and he gets caught, like, trying to, to lure their kids away. Uh, in fact, he gets caught stealing, uh, uh, a, like, a 12-year-old from this indigenous uh a tribe or whatever and they catch him and they they decide they're gonna kill him they bury him up to his head they're gonna <laughs> like literally like a old cartoon they're gonna let him die and this um uh pastor a missionary guy is like no 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 like like you know let's let him go and and, uh, and it'll be for the better and by the way it was not for the better they probably would have been a better story or a, a happier ending if they had had let that happen but uh um, at that point, he's, uh, you know, like I said, he's wandering Peru and, um, uh, he, they deport him. Peru's like, you have to leave the country. You're such a, not a, not a, you're not a good guy. Right. And so he ends up in, um, Ecuador. And so, uh, he's kind of just wandering around Ecuador. This is 1980, by the way. I mean, up till 1980. Okay. Uh, he's wandering around Ecuador and there's a lot of rumors about this guy because a lot, he, he like tries to lure people's children with trinkets. That's the word they always say is trinkets. Like say, Hey, come over here. I'll show you this or whatever. And he's all, and, and, um, there's a lot of children that seem to disappear everywhere he goes, but, um, he's, they, they, nobody's ever pinned anything on him. Right. But anyway, what happens is, uh, there's these flash floods, uh, in Ecuador which is uh, where he's at at the time. And it uh, um, 
basically starts revealing all these bodies. <laughs> There's oh, multiple bodies that they that they start finding. So this is kind of where it starts um, uh, unfolding for him. And uh, he he is trying to he gets caught trying to abduct another twelve year old he gets arrested this twelve year old girl right so they take him down and they question him they're trying to they're asking him these questions and he's like nope don't know anything I don't know what to tell you I don't, I, I got nothing to confess and uh, he goes back to his jail cell and they're like we we got to get a confession out of this guy so they send an undercover officer to be his his cellmate. And so they sit this guy and he starts talking with him, you know, and uh, he's like, hey, come on, you know, you, you probably, you, 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 if you didn't kill that girl, you know, but you, you would have tried to kill, you know, you've killed other girls, right? And he's like, well, let me see it. He starts, he's like, starts sticking through his head, right? And he goes, uh, well, I killed, when I was in Ecuador, I killed at least 200 people. <laughs> um, and then when I was in Peru, that they then the, the article I read said he, uh, tens of people, so dozens of people, whatever that is. Uh, and then he goes, yeah. And then there was a bunch in Colombia. I don't really know, but uh, that's you know somewhere around three hundred. <laughs> that's his number. And uh, you know, so so they go back and they're like, this guy has got to be he, he's got to be full of it. Like nobody has murdered three hundred people. It's, it's not possible, right? Uh, and so this guy's hitting him up for more information and they're, and they're like, Hey, well, like, well, you know, if you murdered that many people, where's the bodies? And he's like, Oh, well, um, if, uh, uh, you go here in Ecuador, it's where I put a bunch of them. And so they go there in Ecuador and, uh, they found it's uh, 52 or 56, uh, no 53. They find 53 bodies. Holy smoke. So he was telling the truth. He is telling the truth. Um, uh, he, he's an absolute maniac, right? And so Ecuador, they're like, oh my God, like you are under arrest really bad. <laughs> like you're under the bad kind of arrest. Um, now, uh, they, they do this trial and, um, uh, he's convicted and, and I'm just going to we'll throw this out. What do you think his sentence is? I mean, I would say, well, I don't know if they have the death penalty, but at the bare minimum life. I mean, he killed right. well, 53 the, people? That's life. 53 people, right. 53 well, consecutive max, life sentences. How's that? The maximum sentence they had at that time in Ecuador is 16 years. Oh, God. So he is sentenced to 16 years. Uh, and then, um, but he gets out after only 14 uh, on good behavior. <laughs> they let him go? Okay. Yes. So in Holy 1994. Moly. They let him go, but they said, oh, by the way, you're kicked out of Ecuador. Uh, and they said, hey, where else did you commit all these other crimes? Uh, how about um, uh, Colombia? Because he said, you know, originally he said in Colombia, he was like, oh, yeah, there's a few few dozen bodies there, right? So Ecuador is like, we're sending you right to Colombia, okay? So he goes to Colombia. And they, they arrest him immediately when he walks across the border. And uh, they put him through their system and they go, this guy is mentally insane. He's a nut job. Okay? Yeah. So they don't they don't put him in jail. They put him in a mental institution. But part of their system is every so, awesome, uh, every so often they retest you to see if you're uh, sane or, or insane. And if you're sane, they let you go. So uh, after four years... He was declared sane. This was in 1998. And so they said, well, here's the deal. We got to let you go, but um, you have to register as, you know, an, an offender. You have to report back for probation, uh, all this stuff. And he goes, sure. He has never been seen again. He walked away from their system in uh, 1998 and he never checked back in. Holy! So <laughs> how old is this guy? Do we know that? Uh, I mean, his first crimes began in '69. So, Wiki says he's 70. So this guy could still be walking around the planet, which is what you're telling me. 100. percent Yeah, he'd be in his 70s. He'd be in his 70s. Um, now, 
Uh, the thing is, is that one of the things about this guy is that he had a very recognizable uh, ammo. Like he did the same thing every time, which was he would get these these little, uh, you know, toys or trinkets, and then he would get lure kids away, like away from the crowd or whatever. Now his thing when he was in jail, when he went, you know, was on trial or whatever, he said that he was uh, first sexually abused at the age of eight. And so uh, his goal in life was to um, assault and murder as many children as he could. Yeah, he said that in court. That's his goal, right? So he is not going to stop. Uh, that's it, right? That's what he wants to do. So they know for a fact based on forensics and where he told them where body bodies were uh, and whatnot. So for a fact, they know that he's responsible for 110 murders. However, uh, because there are all these places like where he was, like in Ecuador and Peru and Colombia and where they know he was, where people said, hey, there was this guy and he lured children away uh, and then we never saw our kids back. Uh, so they they basically know, but they didn't find bodies. But that number is about 300. So they believe that he's responsible for at least 300 murders. Uh, now, the scariest part of this story is that in, um, uh, let me look and see where it was. Uh, in Colombia, these people reported that this uh, a middle-aged man lured a child away from this public space and the child was never seen again. And based on, you know, what he looked like, what they said to authorities, they're 99% sure it was him. That was in 2012. So he's still out there. He's still, uh, I mean, like the, the, the last thing you want to do, I mean, let's, let's put it as a one, two, two things. The last two things you want to do with a serial murderer is one, let them go and two, lose track of where they are. But that is what happened uh, in the case of uh, Pedro Lopez. So, this is, uh, again, he was, his name was put in the Guinness Book of World Records as being the world's most prolific serial killer. Then they did remove that. They said that really wasn't uh, a world record that they wanted people shooting for to break. So, um, so they did take that out. But uh, Pedro Lopez is a name that most people are not familiar with. But what, what's amazing to me, and, and this is something that we talked about at the top of the program, is that there's really two ways for me to think i mean any type of murder um is dark for you to 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 end another human being's life i mean that's a, that's a dark thing right um but to get on this list it was really kind of two things for, you know for both of us one would be um you know the the types or uh, the the grisliness of the actual crimes committed you know things like uh, jack the ripper i mean the 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 bodies were so mutilated it was such a horrible crime um you know so so that's why those people were on the list but the other one is is sheer numbers so i mean to put it in perspective like like um on the nightly news you might say like oh someone someone got killed someone shot somebody and and that person you know they they killed someone like jack the ripper only killed four more people than that <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think um, the son of Sam only has six uh, uh, actual, it's either six or eight, but it's less than 10, right? So, I mean, so these are, you know, serial killers, but you know, to compare that to the potentially 300 is a, a mind boggling and just what a, a twisted individual who has turned um, to make that his goal in life. You know, it's just a terrible, terrible person. So, um, but, uh, fortunately I don't think, uh, uh, I know you and I, and hopefully none of our, our viewers or listeners, uh, are in Colombia. but if you happen to see a guy that looks like Pedro Lopez, you might want to call authorities because there's a potential that he is still out there today. You know, that's a, that's a heck of a story there. Very grisly. I mean, that's a quite, you're right. I'd never heard of this. I never heard of any of this. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how, in some ways, this dovetails uh, back to the Victorian age in, in a couple of key ways. Here's a, you know, 
what was going on in the Victorian age was incredible poverty uh, and lots of mm -hmm. uh, kids out in the streets. And what happens in your uh, in Latin America is occasionally, depending on the year, depending on the ruler, very similar. I mean, we've got, they've got gang problems now. It's a very probably a very similar thing where people are cast out. In the street. Here's a kid that's cast out in, at eight years old. And, yeah. you know, when you – if you think about what well, I could – you could barely probably remember what you were doing when you were eight. But it was, you know, learning how to use the, t the potty and, like, uh, learning how to write, you know, low-end stuff, play with Tinker Toys. And if so, I can't imagine what a person would be like on the after being on the streets and surviving, uh, how twisted that could uh, that could uh, that can make a person, how much it can affect their mind, uh, and it's a um, it's a it's a small leap for me to hear this kid's upbringing, the sexual assault, the early imprisonment, the uh, the living on the streets. It's a small leap to think that this could make someone murderous. And you're truly, uh, in my opinion, you're truly uh, creepy serial killers are the people that take killing as naturally as you and I would take, uh, you know, uh, getting a pizza or going out for a, a movie. I mean, it's just, this is a part of their, uh, this is part of their makeup. The murder is, is, uh, is uh, part of their uh, fabric. And when that happens, uh, there really is no limit on what you'll do as long as you can keep getting away with it. And what better way, place to get away with it than a poverty-filled area with lots of easy targets and a, and a questionable right. police force. Yep. So yep. That, is, that, is, that is quite a tail, Flack, I will say. And it makes me not want to go to Columbia anytime soon. Uh, and the fact that this guy could have been responsible for something in 2012 makes me feel better about our own justice system. Uh, but I will say that because yeah, that is yeah. that's unbelievable. What do you do? You recall where you first heard about this case? Uh, you know what? I I literally I remember seeing something about the uh, the Guinness Book thing. You know about that? Yeah. It, that's that's where the name had come up, and so I think that's where I'd first seen it. I will correct you on one thing. Uh, when I was eight, I was not learning how to be potty trained. I was learning how to program in BASIC on a TRS eighty. Oh, so that's okay. What I was doing when Listen, I was eight. you you were particularly uh, well. <laughs> Well adjusted child. I'm still working on the potty train to this day, unfortunately. I'll get there. I'll get there, brother. Uh, that's for sure. Hey, listen, we are just about up against the wall here and out of time uh, for another episode of uh, Conversation with the Dark Side. I want to thank everyone who tuned in live. Again, we are uh, this this month, we're filming all these at 9 o'clock uh, on Fridays in October. We've got two more big episodes left to go. So we'll be back next Friday at 9 p.m. Uh, again, if you are so inclined, uh, you may uh, reach us at, at uh, the dark side at mail.com. You can also uh, call our toll-free uh, voicemail hotline. It drives in directly to uh, the automated answering machine, or you can text it at 304-397-0810. Be the first uh, this season. To chime in, <laughs> and we'd love to have you know we're going to collect all your ghost stories or your encounters, uh, and uh, present them later on in the month. So that's always a good time. Flack, thanks as always, man, for uh, hanging around, uh, and we will turn you guys loose. If I ever meant this, I've never meant it more than I do right now. Make sure you go out and lock your doors and windows, because there's a lot of bad crap going down on the dark side. Good night, everybody. You have just experienced conversations from the dark side. Until next week, try to enjoy the daylight. <laughs> <laughs>